This is the pre the pre-dinner, pre-drinks uh, warm-up. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sir Simon Stevens, who's going to be uh, in conversation with well, you collectively, but in particular uh, with uh, one of my uh, star, one of my many star members of staff, Mark Diane. Mark, over to you. Thanks. Um, thank you for giving me another opportunity to be Nick Timmons's dodgy out of our locum cover. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask Simon a few quick questions on four main themes and then throw it open to the floor for most of the time. So start coming up with the questions. I should say there will be one question allowed on coronavirus, not much more than that. So, so I'm starting off with NHS reform. One of the themes that we're keen to look at at the Nuffield Trust at the moment is learning from history. Um, this year is a five or even six years since the five-year forward view, um, which kind of marked the start of the direction the NHS is still on and was your first big document. Do you think the five-year forward view met its aims? Well, I spent uh, the rest of today, uh, sadly not here, which would have been brilliant, but with uh, another group of brilliant people um, from uh, West Yorkshire and from uh, uh, parts of the uh, Northwest uh, more generally, as well as some of the other um, integrated care systems around the country. And when you ask them that question, they are mm. clear that, yes, they think they have begun to make a meaningful difference. Does that mean it's uniform across the country? No. And part of the discussion we were having, uh, although it was a sort of Chatham House conversation, was what do you do about those places that are uh, not advancing fast enough or are stuck. Um, but for sort of four-fifths of the country, I think you could say, yes, there has been uh, a significant move towards the kind mm. of uh, population orientation, joined-up services uh, that everybody recognises a modern health system needs to uh, be configured around. Mm. But what it perhaps didn't achieve was the kind of reduction in demand that it anticipated, so the NHS would double its rate of efficiency improvements and be able to cope with only 8 billion extra funding up to now. So what do you learn from that? Was it too ambitious? Well, we've had, we've, uh, had more funding than that over that period, uh, as you know, Mark. And some of the things that, uh, frankly, we would have wanted to see, uh, some of the wider action on uh, public health and uh, prevention, uh, some of the uh, resilience in social care, uh, and frankly, a five-year uh, budget for workforce growth and education and training. Uh, we weren't blessed with those, but hopefully now, looking out over the next five years, we can be. Mm. So I think that's finished my, my historical bit. Let's look forward to the and think about the legislative proposals that, that NHS England brought forward last year. Um, do you think legislative change should be more radical than your proposals now we've got a majority government? Well, when you say radical, what you mean is, uh, should it have more of a top-down administrative reorganisation feel? Radical in different <laughs> ways. See, I don't think that is radical. I think what we've actually learnt from the history of the uh, various administrative reorganisations in the NHS is that that actually is incredibly superficial. Uh, actually, where the rubber really hits the road is around... Uh, the interaction that uh, teams of people have with uh, patients, the way in which the statutory sector works with the voluntary organisations, the way in which we work horizontally uh, across uh, public services. And yesterday I spent part of the morning with the chief constables and the police and crime commissioners mm. across England. And we were talking about the pressures on the police service, the changes they need to bring about. And of course, one of the biggest things they want our help with is access to mental health services uh, for many of the same people who then show up in the criminal justice system mm. because of the absence of mental health. So I think radicalism is tackling those kinds of things, not mucking around with the administrative superstructure. So it's, it's not a legislative radicalism, and so you Correct. wouldn't support putting ICSs, making them legal bodies, giving the statutory footing. Well, there's a, there's a proposal um, to bring together the various uh, entities that uh, already exist. Let them pull. The if the corollary of the question, though, is would you abolish foundation trusts, lock, stock and barrel, and create something instead called an ICS, uh, I think that would, be, uh, that would not go with the grain of what we heard from the NHS as people saying uh, the problem set that needs resolving. And I understand when uh, I think uh, Matt was asked the same question this afternoon, uh, he rightly said that the point of the legislation is actually to remove uh, some of the obstacles mm. that people perceive to uh, joined up working locally rather than uh, getting stuck on a sort of centralising top-down reorganisation. Mm. So, last point on this, let's talk about a level of top-down reorganisation that, that's more top than you are. We've also seen proposals 
leaked to the Times that would involve increasing the government's power over NHS England, and in fact, specifically over you, um, as it turned <laughs> out. There's a lot of talk of levers. Many of those levers seem to be mainly attached to you. What do you make of that? Well, uh, look, I mean, I, I think the uh, reality is we do have a publicly accountable health service in this country. It's publicly funded. There are a variety of mechanisms through which that accountability is exercised. Um, but it, part of the legislative proposals is that there would be a coming together of at least three separate statutory bodies mm. uh, in the form of NHS England, Monitor, and the Trust Development Authority. And those three have different bases of accountability. So we've got to resolve that question. And frankly, I'm pretty relaxed about it because I think as long as you've got an agreed strategic direction, which we have in the form of the long-term plan, then the rest is a second order question. Mm. So you're not that worried about it? As I said, I'm, I'm not only not worried, I'm relaxed. Excellent. Um, switching away from health, what do you hope for from social care reform, which we've been promised by the government? What do you think it needs to achieve? Um, at least two things. Uh, the first is that a significant proportion of any extra public funding going into social care has to buy an increase in the amount of social care mm. that is available to people, not just a redistribution of who pays for the current volumes. Um, so said another way, uh, it might be desirable uh, to make certain things that are currently means tested free, but just doing that does not actually buy you a single extra hour of home care or a single extra care home place. And as we look at the unmet need in social care, it's clearly very important that we get the second uh, in addition to whatever uh, the political process decides to mm. the right answer on the first. So, so th th the first thing is the availability of sufficient social care in the round. The second thing I think we'd be looking for is that this not just be a debate around support for older people, uh, particularly long-term mm. care, but also recognises the very significant pressures in social care for people with uh, learning disabilities and or autism, uh, mental health services, uh, which are around half of the budget uh, for social care from local authorities. And so we've actually got to think about social care in the round, not just from the lens of uh, my parents' generation. Mm. It's interesting that, that your priority for social care actually funding more social care. That could be said to be quite different from a priority that's about people not having to sell their homes to pay for care, which arguably is just giving their money to fund care they would have paid for themselves anyway. Well, my, my point, Mark, is it, it absolutely could be both and. That's a choice for elected government mm. to make. But it has to deal with the unmet need in social care as well as uh, those other considerations as well, if we're going to, as Jeremy Hunt has rightly said, uh, avoid some of the uh, pressures on the NHS, uh, as well as giving dignity uh, in old age and responsive community services for other client groups. And just lastly on social care, we've obviously had new migration proposals, which essentially mean that nobody could migrate to the UK to be a, a, an ordinary care worker. Does that worry you? Well, we've got around 120,000 vacant posts in <clears throat> social care. And so we've got to join the dots. Uh, it is uh, the case that if there is uh, lower um, international employment in uh, social care, uh, there will need to be compensating funding for the extra pay pressures that uh, social care providers will experience. These are all legitimate policy choices for a government to make, uh, but you've just got to join the dots. Mm. Extra funding that potentially wouldn't buy any more care, but, but really pay for more for the same. Well, there, there are significant uh, unit cost pressures in social care, and obviously the cost of being able to uh, employ sufficient people is a main driver of that. Mm. So let's talk for a bit about the, the Marmot review, the 10 mm. years on Marmot review that, that yeah. came out <clears throat> earlier. Um, it pointed to a, the, the fact that your tenure has been quite exceptional in some ways as a leader of the NHS and that it's seen a slowdown or even a stop in a trend of improving life expectancy that went on for most of or nearly all the NHS's lifetime up till now. How do you think that's affected the NHS while you've been in charge of it? Well, nice try, Mark. Um, <laughs> uh, Actually, uh, actually, Michael's uh, timeline starts, I think, in 2010, 2011. Um, and, of course, when you decompose that, uh, what you see is um, it's actually quite a kind of nuanced picture. 
Mm. Now, there are a whole series of things that Michael points to uh, that will not have helped in terms of the wider determinants uh, of health. But I also think it's worth looking at the uh, work of the uh, Longevity Sciences panel, who published this month as well. And they point out that actually it's a really um, complex picture comparatively when you look internationally in that we have seen similar trends in countries, in some countries that didn't experience austerity. And he, uh, that, sorry, the uh, Longevity Sciences Panel points particularly mm. to Germany, which has obviously not had kind of macro austerity in the way that uh, the UK has and has had some of the similar trends. It also points to the fact that a number of the elements of the slowdown in the growth in life expectancy are actually attributable to things that happened to population cohorts during the 2000s, particularly obesity, some of the changes in cardiovascular disease risk status and so forth. So I think, you know, there is a puzzle here. There are some plausible hypotheses, uh, but as both uh, Michael points out and other researchers have uh, said the same, uh, really understanding what's happening around these life expectancy differences is still not completely nailed. Mm. And so what are there actions that you would consider to try and turn that situation around, either from wider public services or actually from within the NHS? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if you think about, uh, and I know uh, Chris uh, Witty uh, this afternoon was talking about some of the uh, sort of health risk factors and the sort of population uh, health burdens, we can see what our future looks like uh, on a number of current trends. Mm. I mean, we've got, in fact, figures out this week show that we've got just under two million people uh, sort of, uh, sort of pre-diabetic or at risk of uh, type two uh, diabetes. And we know there are certain things that the NHS can do. We've had mm. about a quarter of a million people through the diabetes prevention program. Uh, but frankly, our wider uh, obesogenic environment, we are not making the changes needed in order to tackle that. So, you know, even in the last few days, we've seen reports of increased availability of junk food outlets in many parts of the country, which is contrary to the stated goals in the uh, Public Health England uh, plan. Uh, we need, therefore, to tackle some of those if we are going to, looking out over the next decade, uh, get off some of that uh, escalator. And do you think that's for public health in the sense of the kind of services that get funded through the public health grant, or is that for regulatory action? It's a combination. It's going to be uh, fiscal, it's going to be regulatory, it's going to be uh, lifestyle modification support. And as I say, I mean, the, uh, you know, one of the programs I'm proudest of that uh, NHS England has uh, sponsored over the last several years has been the uh, Diabetes Prevention Program. Uh, Jonathan Vallabji, Parthikar have done a fantastic job with that, uh, reproducing and scaling uh, an evidence-based program uh, with RCTs in five countries, now getting better results for uh, the reduction in uh, type 2 uh, risk than seen in those original trial studies. And we're scaling that from a face-to-face -face program to a digital program. Now, you could have argued that is something you could just have said is, you know, it should be a matter of a, you know, public health uh, rather than for the NHS. We said, look, we, we need to step up and play our part in some of that. But that's both and. That's not an alternative to some of the other measures that need to be taken. Great. I'm going to finish with a couple of questions on general practice. I know we've got a lot of GPs and people interested in that in the room. Um, so I'll start with a couple and then throw it open. And we can start there before all the coronavirus takes over. Um, so first off, in our session earlier, a lot of people welcomed the pledge for 6,000 more GPs as well as the other types of staff. I, mean, I think everybody agrees that that would be great. But obviously, we had an earlier commitment in the DH's plan for the last five years for 5,000 more GPs. And in fact, numbers went down. So what's going to be different this time? Um, well, uh, if you think about it, there are three moving parts, essentially. So let's talk about each of them. Mm. Um, the hardest to crack is the uh, early retirement rate. Um, the second hardest to crack is the uh, sort of mid-career participation rate. And the easiest to crack is expanding the number of young doctors who choose general practice. Now, if we were having this conversation four years ago, you wouldn't have put them in that order necessarily. Mm. Uh, I mean, it has been a remarkable turnaround over the last couple of years that uh, GP training, training uh, 
numbers are the highest they have ever been, and we've seen that, uh, and that's a tribute to uh, HEE, to, I see Simon Gregory's here, uh, to the uh, RCGP, uh, the GPC, all of whom got behind this campaign uh, to explain that actually being a GP is one of the most diverse, uh, important, and future-proof roles in an era when medical generalism is of increasing, not decreasing importance, and young doctors have responded to that. But the question is, for our mid-career GPs, how do we get sufficient flexibility? And for GPs uh, in their uh, 50s and 60s, uh, how do we keep people uh, engaged in the uh, general practice workforce? Part of the answer to that is, uh, is there light at the end of the tunnel? And so it's no accident that actually having another 26,000 non-GP primary care professionals as part of expanded practice teams mm the resilience that uh, primary care networks uh, potentially create, uh, the earmarked extra investment, those things are good in their own right, but they're also part of the sort of light at the end of the tunnel strategy. Um, so we will have to get a combination of those three, uh, retention, uh, mid-career uh, participation rates, and continued growth in the number of young doctors using general practice, which is a key part of the proposition going, I think, from three and a half to 4,000 or 4,000 plus GP training spots, uh, plus an extended uh, length in the vocational training scheme. And then looking at the priorities for what you do with that hopeful expansion, final expansion in the workforce, um, one of the things that's, that's got worse in general practice in recent years is continuity, the ability of people who want to see a preferred GP to actually see them. And there's quite good evidence that, that it is good for mortality, that it even helps to reduce hospital emissions. But would you, would you accept the criticism that access has been a much higher priority than continuity over the last few years? No, because I don't think that is actually the explanation for the decrease mm. in continuity. The decrease in continuity is not because access has been prioritised or improved. Actually, the patient experience of being able to uh, get a, a quick appointment to your practice has been steadily getting worse, mm. and we've got to turn that around. Uh, the... Uh, factor that most explains uh, that continuity difference has been the composition of the workforce. Um, and so, you know, if you've got a majority of, um, uh, in many practices, a majority of GPs uh, in their 40s, 50s, choosing to work less than full time, uh, together with the calls that the health service is placing on GPs in other parts of the, the service, um, you are not going to be in a situation where you had one doctor with a list available uh, night and day throughout the year. And so that, that, that is the conundrum. That's the circle mm. to be squared, essentially. How do you actually be a flexible employer, recognizing that people will want different options over the course of their career, want to be able to work part-time, and give some version of continuity? And there are a couple of ways into that. One, of course, is um, using uh, 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 segmenting your patient uh, population for those for whom continuity actually matters uh, versus those who are actually presenting in general practice for a kind of one-off uh, fix and off you go. Um, and so in general, we've got to be more differentiated, I think, uh, even if it's within the practice or the PCN. Um, you know, the urgent care, primary care uh, interaction is not necessarily the same as the long-term uh, relationship and chronic disease management that you will have with some patients. I fully get there will be crossover before anybody mm. says it, but by and large, you can be more differentiated. And the second piece is you can't just get continuity by virtue of the personal memory of the single individual who is your GP. You've got mm. to find other ways of building that into the way the practice itself is organized. Great. Right, I'm not going to follow up on that one. I'm going to throw it open to the floor. So I think we've got people with roving mics. Well, we've got at least one person with a roving mic. Um, and she can move quickly. So, um, yeah, hands up. Let's, uh, uh, lady over here. Let's. Thank you. Um, Andrea Sutcliffe, the uh, Chief Executive of the Nursing Midwifery Council. Nice to see you, Simon. Um, and thank you so much for what you said about social care. Um, I think that your leadership on that, um, from NHS England's perspective, is really great, um, particularly emphasising the importance of meeting unmet need and um, the broader groups that we need to support in social care in terms of learning disabilities and people um, with mental health problems as well as older people. 
but I just want to challenge you a little bit, um, as you might imagine. <laughs> um, uh, the issue for people using services, um, as I know from my own family's experience, is that the system is actually practically very difficult to navigate mm -hmm. between health and social care and um, uh, in and around that and that the workforce issues are interdependent, and that's especially so for nurses. Mm -hmm. um, so a focus on 50,000 nurses for the NHS, you know, what does that mean for social care and robbing Peter to pay Paul is not necessarily going to help, and we've got pressures and vacancies in social care as well. So I think Prana is doing an absolutely fantastic job with the people plan and the work and the focus um, uh, on nurses and other aspects of that. But how can we join up the dots? How can we join up the dots when the NHS people plan is an NHS people plan um, and you know, some of the system issues are not really um, making as much of a practical difference at the, the sharp end as we might want for um, the people who are using services? Thank you. Yeah, well, and thank you, Andrea, as well, because I think particularly when it comes to the nursing elements of this, um, the role that you are playing in helping the NMC uh, be a sort of a thoughtful and creative participant in the conversation about new routes into nursing and uh, supporting the growth that we're going to need for the social care workforce as well as the NHS is absolutely essential. Um, I mean, I guess at the heart of what you're saying is you can't just think about, uh, you can't solely think about 50,000 nurses in the NHS. We've also got to think about the uh, wider uh, nursing workforce in uh, social care and indeed go beyond nursing as well. And that is... I mean, we can't publish a credible people plan if it doesn't have uh, budgeted investments in education and training that look across uh, both sectors. Hmm. Uh, okay, great. Let's have hands up again. Um, got the, uh, the one at the back just there. Um, actually, let's have the, the, the woman next to Becky and then we'll have Becky, I think. Thank you. Um, I'll probably ask a more controversial question here, um, but um, you've been sort of the chief exec for NHS England and NHS Improvement for a few few years now. Um, I kind of like often wonder uh, around policy when it comes to inclusion and around the decision, decision makers. Now you go into acute trust, you know, people that actually provide the care, and you look at trusts that are in specific areas like uh, predominantly the demographics represent more of BME uh, patients in those areas. I'll give examples <coughs> of let's say St. George's Hospital, King's College, Bart's Health. And if you look at the policymakers and the sort of the senior management teams, there's no representation of people, uh, representation of the demographics of the people that they save. Now, you have things around diabetes, which we all know from research that um, it predominantly affects, you know, people from BME backgrounds. Now, uh, someone goes and tells my grandmother, for example, oh, you need to give up on carbohydrates, someone who does not look like her, the first thing she'll say is, who are you to tell me what I need to eat and what I shouldn't be eating? If I went and spoke to her, she will look at me and understand me at that level as well. Now, I think um, the NHS is missing a point here in terms of recruiting people in those areas and in, you know, in senior management roles that will represent people that we save in the demographics in terms of management and reduction of waste around the services we provide. So diabetes, if we don't have people that represent a lot of the people that actually get affected by that, we'll keep fighting, we'll keep <coughs> pumping in services, you know, money into you know, those services, it's not gonna improve as much. You look at sickle cell, for example, only affects BME people. You look at the policymakers, none of them represents that. So, you know, I, as a chief exec, um, and I know you chief exec for NHS England and NHS Improvement, I don't know how much um, influence you have on acute trust. How would you ensure <laughs> have enough, how much influence do you enough have? people at that representation? Or how would you influence a policy around government? Because obviously you are quite powerful in terms of ensuring that there's that representation at the top. Because I kind of like struggle all the time with that. You know, you get at a le certain level and then that's it. And then we are, you know, BME people, you, you get more of the disciplinary around, you know, you're more performance managed, you know, all those things. And, you know, you, you don't stay in jobs for, for a very long time. So, you know, Brilliant. that's why I said it's a bit controversial, but I think it's something that's been burning. And 
I think that's something we need to start tackling and Thank looking you. at if we need to save money in the Thanks. NHS. So um, we'll have Becky's question as well, and then we'll do a, a batch of two. I think that'd be good. Um, so Rebecca Rosen from the Nuffield Trust and a GP. So thanks for that, for your comments on um, continuity. I totally agree that the fragmentation of the workforce and part-time working has contributed and that it needs to be targeted. Not everybody can have it, not everybody wants it. But I guess I would question your conclusions about how to address delivering continuity where it's needed. So the research that NHSE commissioned from Nuffield about continuity of care showed that it really needs to be designed into the way that you deliver, design and deliver your general practice services. And with the government very strong focused on rapid access, there is a significant risk that we highlighted that if you just focus on that, you will reduce mm. your ability to deliver continuity and therefore lose the benefits for mortality, lower, re lower referral rates, etc. So my, my challenge would be to maintain a focus on access to continuity where it is needed to reduce the risk that it is forgotten in the rush for rapid access that is the policy priority. <laughs> So do you want to do, should we do the, yeah. the question about the lack of minority ethnic representation? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, if I, maybe, yes, okay. So first of all, I think you made two very good points, not only about the importance for the NHS being able to, uh, on a sort of fairness point of view as an employer and being able to tap into the talents of all of the people, given we're the biggest employer of BME staff in the country, but your related point that actually this is essential if we're going to deliver accessible, high quality services to the communities in which we're actually operating. And your sickle cell example was a great case in, in point there. So the question then is, okay, if that's the analysis, what are we doing about it? And are we going fast enough? Um, we, everybody here I'm sure knows about the uh, workforce rates equality standard, the uh, most recent report of that, which is actually sort of lagged a year, was just published a fortnight ago. What, what that showed was that there has been no uh, meaningful improvement in the experience of uh, BME staff uh, across the NHS, despite the fact that there has been an improvement in the reported objective HR measures, if I can put it that way. The core HR processes are working better in the sense of the chances of a white or a black candidate being shortlisted, uh, the chance of a white versus a BME member of staff going through disciplinary, getting access to discretionary training. Those core HR processes are improving, but the experience of being a BME member of staff across the NHS uh, has not. And Part of that, of course, is where you then led us to, which is um, the sort of uh, filtration of opportunity uh, through the senior ranks uh, in the NHS. That is true in management for boards. It's also true uh, particularly, actually, in uh, senior nursing ranks. And Ruth May is completely committed to driving change there, as is Jackie Dunkley-Bent in uh, midwifery services. In terms of management, uh, we've had a 30% increase in the number of BME uh, senior managers uh, in the NHS. Uh, we have got in London now a situation where every trust board has at least one, uh, and arguably it should be far more than that, but at least one BME uh, non-exec, which was not the case uh, three years ago, pretty disgracefully. And what we are now doing is asking every employer, and this will be true for NHS England and NHS Improvement as well, uh, to set an explicit quantified uh, goal for improving the proportion of uh, our staff who are in the senior ranks uh, in each organisation and then measuring ourselves against that uh, annually. So I think um, your point is well made. I think uh, there is uh, an energy uh, behind this now and I think we will have to be judged uh, by the results uh, over the coming years. Hmm. On uh, Becky's uh, point, well, I mean, I think I agree with you, Becky, really. Uh, all, all I would say is that I don't uh, feel, and Nikki is uh, here, Nikki Kinani, who's obviously leading the uh, GP access review, and I know Nikki uh, gets the point you, you've just made, but I do think we've got to have both and. Um, you know, the fact is that when you ask patients, I mean, general practice is the foundational bedrock of the NHS, as we all know, 300 million patient visits a year. When you ask patients, about their experience of general practice, there is a 13 percentage point difference uh, in what people think about the practice overall versus what they think about being able to get an appointment. Um, and if that gap uh, remains there or carries on widening, then we will see uh, sort of uh, 
people uh, accessing other parts of the service uh, with significant knock-on consequences. You know, we've seen more than, I'm not uh, sort of attributing cause and effect here, but we've seen more than a million extra uh, visits to A&E just in the course of the last year. Uh, having accessible general practice uh, is something we've got to uh, get as a byproduct of the extra investment flowing into primary care. Brilliant, thank you. Um, other hands up, we've got, um, let's have Andy Cowper, middle there. Is it about coronavirus? It's not. not oh, <laughs> there's still one going begging. Um, Andy Cowper, Health Service Journal, a Health Policy Insight. The Secretary of State uh, set two goals in his speech today, and the first of those was to increase healthy life expectancy by five years by 2030. Uh, is your estimation that that is practical, and if so, how will it be done? Well, that is not a new commitment, I don't believe. I think that has uh, been a stated objective uh, of the last government as well. Um, and in terms of how the sort of waterfall out that will get you there, a lot of the things that uh, Chris Woody was talking about are going to be the routes uh, to those gains. There are some things that the NHS can do specifically. Uh, we are obviously leaning hard into cancer survival uh, improvements linked to gains in early diagnosis. Uh, the cardiovascular disease uh, standardized mortality rates, again, the long-term plan propositions around cardiovascular will give us a life expectancy uh, gain. The question of uh, multimorbidity and frailty, I think, is a, is a critical one, which, again, is part of the dividend we will get from uh, a resilient uh, primary care uh, infrastructure. So there are those kinds of elements that the NHS can bring to the uh, equation. But clearly, a lot of this goes back to the discussion that Mark and I were having around uh, the wider determinants and the uh, Marmot and other uh, analyses. So healthy public policy is going to have to be a big part of this as well. Okay, great. Let's have another um, Stephen Dorrell down the front. Had your hand up. Thank you. Uh, Simon, can I bring you back to Andrea Sutcliffe's question around workforce? Mm -hmm. uh, I've been to Nuffield summits over some years and, uh, and had a number of titles in the list of attendees. This year I'm here as the chair of the European movement which is, must be a first for the European movement anyway. Uh, and the, the, the serious point I want to draw out from, what, from Andrea's question is that given the, the changes the government plans on migration policy and given the sensitivity, in particular in some parts of the country, of the health and care workforce as a whole uh, to migration policy, it seems, to, it seems to me, if I may say so, that the answer to Andrea's question needed to be a holistic view across the health and care sector, not just around training, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, actually almost micromanaging, certainly watching uh, pressure points emerging over the next few months, because changes in migration policy could be a significant short-term impact or have a significant short-term impact on the, se the, the sector seen as a whole. Yeah, I mean, we're going to need to continue international recruitment, uh, including for uh, nurses, but other health uh, professions as well, for some time to come. Because given the lead times in expanded undergraduate nursing, uh, hopefully further medical school expansions, I mean, that is just a statement of the obvious. Now, the good news is that when you ask people um, what sort of... Uh, international uh, recruits uh, do you think it would be good for the country to have, uh, people are very uh, aligned with the idea that uh, ethically sourced uh, international health professionals uh, are a good for the health service and for the country. So I think that is a, an argument that uh, we are being heard on. Great. Okay. Uh, got time for another round. Um, the man in the middle there at the table in front of Sarah Scobie. Thank you. Uh, Jihad Malassi, clinical chair for Thanet and GP in, uh, in the Ramsgate Margate area. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the appointment of our accountable officer for the area. Thanet CCG will be defunct now and be part of a larger eight CCG grouping, which I think is positive. My, I have three questions, if, I, if you wouldn't mind. One is about coastal inequalities and 
the regulatory and organizational environment that you spoke about in relation to how we change high streets, how we change people's um, eating habits, smoking, and so on and so forth. That's not an easy thing to tackle from a health perspective and requires a system perspective. So what pressure can be brought to bear and what are your views on that? The second point is around reconfiguration and you were quoted in 2014 regarding the value of DGHs and I'm wondering if your position has altered or moved with regard to noises that have been made by local MPs and so on, Helen Watley, MP. Yeah. And finally, regarding... I think two questions might be... We're oh, actually, we're getting oh come on, we want to know what the third one is. Oh, come on, on. let's... Oh, All right, really on. quick Cut third question. Slack. It, it's, it, it out there. It's a vital question to me. I, I, I feel passionately about this. It's about primary care estate. Now, we've heard a lot about primary care estate and how that cuts through a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Now, it's fine to... to I, I'm also clinical director for the hospital reconfiguration work, and we're putting in a bid, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so I'm not prejudging any of that stuff. With regard to primary care... We are investing money in primary care estate, but we want something that's a bit whiz-bang, a bit Whitstable, you know, a bit... And I know you've been there. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, so we're talking okay. about non-GMS non space and, and how you can actually get third sector providers to play a role in that, but they're not hefty enough financially to take a role. So somebody what? has to make a decision about whether that money can be offered or whether security can be offered to organizations that don't have the, the scale or the ability to take on that kind of space. And I'm wondering what, what the view is on that and how that can be supported. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> well, on, the, on your last point, um, I mean, in a sense, you have become, you're a, you're a more scaled uh, operation across East Kent now, I suppose. There are parts of the country that have got good models for what that looks like. And so, you know, I think, frankly, mutual learning is part of the answer to that. Uh, there's a whole set of issues around the way NHS property services works uh, as just a sort of side discussion in this context. Um, but uh, I think that there are answers to be had there. On the high street, um, local authorities have got a sort of principal role here. There's a debate around the uh, licensing powers that uh, local authorities have. But, you know, four out of ten uh, local authorities have seen an increase in the number of junk food outlets, um, whereas in aggregate we were looking for a reduction. In some cases it's an increase of over a third uh, in the number of junk food outlets. So there's a real kind of issue there that uh, has got to be tackled and councils are probably the best place to, uh, to do that. Um, but as far as your sort of uh, middle question was concerned, no, I still believe that uh, district general hospitals have got a very important role to play. I'm not one of these people who believes that the future of uh, the NHS looks like sort of, you know, just 20 kind of huge mega hospitals with people traveling miles for them. And I think, in fact, some of the trends we are seeing quite recently uh, further reinforce that. So I said last June that it looked as if, given the rising pressures uh, in hospital, uh, some of the uh, reductions uh, that had been seen in the number of hospital beds, uh, that pr trend, we shouldn't assume that that trend would just sort of carry on indefinitely. And I think, uh, actually, we are at an inflection point on that. Figures published today show that for the uh, third quarter of the year, October to December, uh, we've had the biggest increase year on year in hospital beds that we've had in a decade since the records uh, began. And I think we're going to need more uh, inpatient capacity. The fact that we've got over 7,000 extra nurses uh, working uh, in the NHS over the past year has helped with that. So, look, I think uh, we will need that. That doesn't mean, however, that when you look at particular services, uh, there may not be advantages from uh, divvying them up differently. And there's obviously been a judicial review uh, contested in East Kent on stroke services, which the uh, CCGs have won decisively in the courts. Uh, and there's a very strong uh, patient reason for why you would want to make some of those changes. Brilliant. Uh, we actually haven't had our coronavirus question yet, so does anybody want to go well, for Well, Chris it? is uh, going oh, to hand up. There we so go. Maybe, I knew our uh, nation's press uh, It could be coronavirus table over That's there, right. actually, yeah, looking yeah. at some of the characters who are... Uh, <coughs> um, so we, we've heard a bit about um, plans for if we do get a pandemic, because we're not there yet. There's been some talk about... 
uh, how do we have the capacity to cope with this, particularly in critical care? How decisions will be made about prioritizing resources if that happens? Uh, given that the pandemic plans talk about the importance of openness and transparency in making these decisions, can you tell us a bit more about exactly how that will work if we do get a, a large number of cases in this country? Thank you, Chris. Well, look, the first thing to say is an enormous thank you to our colleagues across the NHS who have been stepping up their work dealing with the uh, inquiries, the testing that has been going on over the last several weeks. I also particularly want to thank colleagues from Arrow Park on the Wirral and in Milton Keynes for looking after those who came back and were quarantined. We are seeing big increases in the number of inquiries that 111 is getting and uh, ramping up staffing there. And today, in fact, are rolling out new ways of um, testing based on home testing and drive-by testing, uh, which we're probably going to need more of. So the NHS is clearly uh, ramping up. The um, scenarios that we're dealing with are being uh, looked at by, uh, to answer your question specifically, Chris, uh, the uh, Scientific Advisory Group on Epidemics, SAGE, and a related group that does the uh, epi modeling. They will be providing the uh, scientific advice to government, uh, supported by our work and that of uh, Public Health England. We've seen uh, within the last uh, 36 hours uh, some of the sorts of measures that uh, the Irish government have set out uh, on uh, sports fixtures. I think Chris Whitty this afternoon has talked about the possibility of uh, schools closures, but those are all uh, recommendations that will have to come from those expert bodies for government to consider, and they will need to be uh, proportionate. But in the meantime, there are a set of very practical things that we all need to carry on doing around uh, hand washing and around uh, the way in which we uh, dispose of uh, catch it, kill it, bin it uh, type processes. So there are things we need to do, uh, there are things we need the experts to advise on, and there are things the NHS is doing to uh, act in the here and now and to prepare. Right, I think we've got time for exactly one last question as long as it's a reasonably quick one. So any hands up? Um, Sean, I'll, I'll let you go for it. Is it about coronavirus? <laughs> oh, really quick then, go on. Hi, Simon. I just wanted Hi, to sure. follow up on Chris's question there. And you eloquently talked about the other things that are being done and the advice you're going to get. But you're responsible for the provider sector and the hospitals right now thinking how they will cope with a pandemic coronavirus. ITU consultants told us that they were very, very concerned about how they have a complete lack of capacity and would have to make some very difficult decisions using the three wise men protocol. So I, I think... Uh, can I ask you to expand a bit further specifically on how NHS hospitals would have to cope if we had a serious pandemic outbreak? Well, the uh, sort of medical uh, insight on this particular uh, condition is continuing to uh, develop. There's good information sharing worldwide. The uh, protocols you're describing, Sean, I think uh, relate back to uh, 2009-10 and uh, to... Uh, influenza. So that will be a responsibility for um, the Public Health England and the uh, other uh, clinical experts uh, to advise us and government. But in the meantime, as I say, the key thing that uh, people are giving thought to is, is there a way of, uh, which there likely is, uh, reducing the uh, intensity, the pressure uh, on the NHS through some of the wider uh, public measures and that's where the focus of advice to government is likely to be uh, over the coming uh, days. Right. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to stick to that being our last question because we are a minute over time. I think all that remains is for me to thank you, Simon, for answering such a wide range of questions. And everyone to give a bit of applause to Simon for coming out here and joining us. Thank you.